Well, welcome everyone for the open session for first time attendees at the AERA annual meeting and for new AERA members. But if you found yourself here for another reason and you've gone to an AERA place-based meeting before or are a member of some duration, we are pleased to have you here. We know that the transition to a virtual meeting has, um, um, uh, is different <laughs> and it's a different kind of environment. We've all been working through various kinds of virtual convenings um, over the past, especially over the past 13 months. Somewhat sadly so that a COVID pandemic brought us to this, um, this way of working and operating and collaborating together, uh, though it, has had many opportunities for thinking through how we can together uh, do better. I am Felice Levine, AERA Executive Director, and for this orientation, I am to my much, much to my pleasure, joined by Robert Smith, our Meetings Director and uh, of all meetings and events, and in particular, of course, our annual mega meeting and this will be a mega meeting and we hope will be a mega meeting that will be memorable in its importance and satisfaction for each of you. Uh, in all of our uh, major uh, convenings, including all of the sessions that we anticipate to be of any size at the ARA uh, virtual meeting, we include um, both live closed captioning and for those who, of you who want to uh, view it and read it, um, go to the live transcript bar where it says CC and you will see the live closed captioning. And I am pleased that Leandra will be doing that live uh, closed captioning with us. Already joining us on, the, uh, on this event is um, Amy. Uh, who is doing ASL interpretation, and she will be um, joined by a um, Jessica uh, in roughly uh, 20 minute intervals. They're a marvelous team. And what I mean by that is uh, it's not 20 minutes in any mechanistic way. They'll sense the rhythm of, uh, of where we are and so that it uh, communicates effectively for those who uh, <clears throat> who benefit from uh, um, ASL. It, I, I'll ask Nathan if you would bring the agenda up so uh, you know where we're going. And one of the places where we're going, in addition to where we're all going together on, um, on April 8th, uh, a week from tomorrow, is that um, we, we emphasize the openness of this session so that uh, we really want to ensure we have a sufficient time to hear from you. Uh, currently there are um, probably around uh, 200 or more who have joined us uh, for uh, this event. And so uh, begin populating it with either uh, comments or questions, however large or small, you might have both as we proceed with this session, but as thoughts come to you, we are not using um, the full chat capacity as, as uh, fun it is and engaging it is to chat and chat together. That has a kind of an adverse impact on some of the accessibility technologies that we offer. So, um, uh, so that, uh, the chat is only uh, comments to the panelists, but if you want to pose general issues that are on your mind, whether formulated as a question or not, we'll try to take them up and we very much, I suppose, we very much want to chat with you. So there's not a great formality to this next uh, hour and a half, although we'll try to do um, the mapping that we um, often do uh, at the AERA annual meeting. I should say not only often we do, we always do at the annual meeting, I think stemming back to April 2003, and that is that we have a place-based orientation um, uh, for uh, newcomers and first-timers that this year will be held the morning of the 9th, Robert? 
Yes, that's correct. All right, so that is the typical morning. Uh, we are not doing it as early East Coast, uh, uh, Eastern uh, Daylight Time as we do in a place-based meeting, which is 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. before the traditional start of sessions at, I believe, 8.05. Uh, the, we're starting the meeting later in the day, um, East Coast time, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the virtual meeting and the schedule, um, to really allow as much as we can for everyone coming into the environment, enjoying the environment to, at least in uh, Western and Eastern Europe, um, uh, being at a reasonably joinable time. That is, we recognize far less the case for, um, far, far less the case uh, for um, colleagues in uh, Australia, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong. We had a special morning orientation at 6 a.m. East Coast time yesterday. Um, I'm directed to colleagues around the world uh, and across hemispheres. Uh, I think New Zealand can capture this meeting or, or sometimes later. But one of the features we'll talk about about the virtual meeting is that we are recording all sessions and you, when we, when we show you uh, the virtual annual meeting platform, there is essentially an on-demand library where you can see anything, anytime after that session. And indeed we have provided um, that to run for registrants within the platform uh, for a year. In this uh, orientation, we wanna first talk a little bit as we do in that general orientation, which we will indeed be holding um, um, this year as Robert just indicated on what is day two of the meeting. Uh, one of the things that we try to do in that general orientation is really to sort of talk about not just the meeting, but also why it's structured in the way it is and how it reflects uh, uh, the field, not just AERA's uh, construction of the field, but the field and the emerging field as we see it through both the AERA divisions and the special interest groups in particular. And we'll talk for a little bit about that in a few minutes. Then uh, I will uh, try to walk us through together the various session types. Now, uh, I suppose we have the expectation that many of you who are either new members or first timers may have also submitted for the first time. And we have had orientation sessions for those who are presenters or chairs or commentators or discussants. Um, as well as special sessions for attendees. But we will try to characterize again those sessions so that whether you submitted or not, and they were set forth in the call for submissions, it's a little bit of a reminder about uh, as you attend this meeting, the various, uh, the various formats that are offered. And those various formats that are offered are not just to have a medley of choices, <laughs> but I suppose to have a medley of choices to be able to offer you different kinds of engaged experiences as you go from session to session. So while, for example, papers that have been submitted to the annual meeting, whether place-based or virtual this year, um, those who submit indicate whether they would prefer to be in a paper session, which I'll describe again in a few minutes, whether you would prefer to be in a round table or whether you might prefer to present at a poster session. The underlying paper that you've submitted and that has been peer reviewed and accepted in a competitive process of blind peer review for all papers, all of those papers have the same status within ARA, they've been competitively selected with a success rate of perhaps overall 45%. And that means you've made it with a first step in the knowledge production cycle, your first paper from your work, whether empirical, theoretical, or methodological, and that you are at a point where you want to present that work 
with the underlying paper to college. So whether you've chosen to or requested being placed in a paper session or a round table or a poster, these are all accepted papers, uh, papers that if you put those papers in the online paper repository, these remain your papers, but you get a unique DOI for that paper. And it is uh, open access that can be shared uh, worldwide with others after the meeting. If you choose to do an interactive presentation based on your paper, you can you can use that mode when you present your paper, or you can just be in the interactive presentation gallery and present without any visual or with PowerPoint, Prezi, or whatever you might choose to do, including uh, using your interactive presentation. So I will, I've highlighted a little bit about those sessions, but I wanna go through those uh, a little bit more systematically. And then as a way of understanding what's available, in the meeting for a first timer, um, how it is ARA and the various activities that are undertaken in specialty areas throughout the year, how that kind of graphs onto the annual meeting. Um, all or many of you may have some planned presentations or sessions you wanted to go to. You may be a presenting author, you may be um, a commentator. Uh, you may be a uh, non-presenting author and you might go to that session and, and to other sessions. And one of the best ways to understand, um, I'm gonna say how you experience the meeting, and I'll use the term shop around, but not in any flip sense, how you can really value and experience the meeting in a range of ways is to use the tool already available when we released it, I think it was about February 15th-ish, uh, which is the, um, uh, the online program. At the point we released it, it did not have every session being offered. It did not have the presidential sessions yet posted. It did not have the AERA special series on research and science policy issues. It did not have all of the major um, uh, lectures and talks yet posted, but it did have, and this is what I wanna emphasize, it did have 97, 98% of the meeting because that meeting, the AERA meeting is not driven by invitation. As important as those sessions are and as much as you may choose and we encourage you to experience and go to them, the annual meeting is driven by you and your colleagues. The 12,000 plus submissions that come in as either session submissions or paper submissions. And in a way, that's what the meeting is, is about. You know, your, your opportunity to network, to communicate, to hear the latest work and to go to a range of sessions that have really been driven by the research community uh, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Everyone is welcome. And as importantly, we want both this session and our meetings to be welcoming, inclusive, and mutually supportive environments. After we go through a kind of a crosswalk of how you can visualize the meeting or experience it already by using the tools in the, um, in the uh, 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 online searchable program in the AERA website. And many of you may have already been in, maybe you've cherry picked and looked at things within your specialty, or uh, if you were on a paper session or a round table, you're wondering who's on that paper session and round table with you. Uh, but we wanna give a little higher level way that you can begin to feel and experience what the environment would look like, whether place-based or here in this context, um, uh, a virtual platform. And then we will go through that virtual platform so that you have a, a touch and feel of that asset. And I suppose um, before I go back to uh, the structure of the ARA meeting and reflect on the meeting and our field in the context of the annual meeting. I want to emphasize that ARA thought and our council and leadership thought hard and long about whether we should use one of the 
products and I don't in any way mean to critique any of them. We're using Zoom right now. These are great for one-offs, one event that you might attend, a professional development, uh, or one of our forums or others that are being offered by other uh, scholarly and scientific societies, other organizations and institutions. Uh, many of our divisions and SIGs have done many of those one-offs. But when you want to have a collective experience where everyone can come to an environment, can meet up with each other formally and informally, where we are protected from what's called Zoom bombing, but there's the equal, equal problems of, of being in WebEx, where you need to remember and save many, many URLs and where you have software that is not always so stable on your um, desktop or laptop or iPad. This is a single sign-in environment. It's as close as we can get to all being together. When you come and sign in, you don't have to do anything, but go to where you wanna go, where you can set up just as we have in a place-based meeting, uh, an app in addition to the program on our website that you can put on your phone or on your iPad or whatever other product you have. Here, you don't need those products. That app is essentially the program that you will see in the, um, in the virtual space you're entering. So it really is our community. It's like being on an island together or if everything were contained, I think it's a lot warmer than just going to a convention center. No escalators, no elevators. You can go rapidly to where you wanna go if you create my schedule, you will see you hit an arrow and you get to that session. If you uh, wanna network informally, Robert and I will walk you through how that happens. If you don't use my schedule, you can just go through the schedule that has, will have all of the search functionalities as the AERA online program on our website right now. And as the app for those of you who've been to a, either I or other, uh, either AERA or other, um, uh, annual meetings with apps where you can, you know, sort and search. You can you can easily do the same thing even if you don't set up my schedule or if you decide, well, I don't want to go to something on my schedule. I want to go back. You can search by a committee. You can search by division and SIG time of day. If it's spontaneous, you, spontaneous. You can put in two features and say a special interest group and a. Um, and it's uh, 2.40 uh, in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. And, um, um, and actually this will be calibrated to your own time zone. So you won't have to worry about those kinds of mathematics um, uh, and, and get to really want where you wanna go, uh, including many informal kinds of opportunities. And one of the features of our place-based meeting is the way you could say to others, let's hang out and have lunch together. Well, you can have lunch together in the literal sense of physically being together, but you can actually schedule it as I'm sure many of you do already in your fam familial or po collegial networks, getting together at times where you might have um, um, a late afternoon um, coffee or wine or whatever is your preference or a dinner or a breakfast. And we've kind of created that in that environment. And that is, as I return to the discussion of the structure of the ARA, um, ARA annual meeting, uh, that is um, what we're trying to offer in, in the virtual space. So um, the ARA annual meeting for those of you who remember <laughs> the call for submission, and there'll be a new one coming out, uh, for the, uh, in uh, mid-May for the 2020, 2022 annual meeting, which we uh, expect to be place-based in San Diego. When that call goes out, uh, the basic units for submission are the AERA um, 12 divisions. And Robert, can you pull up those 12 divisions? Or the 150 uh, special interest groups, which are special interest groups around 
um, around research arenas. Uh, so they're not, uh, uh, so here you see the um, 12 divisions. Uh, most of the submissions to an annual meeting are to one of those divisions. Larger divisions have subsections within them. And so if you look at uh, social context of education or K, with, uh, you will see that there were units to which um, uh, one can submit papers or session submissions. So the structure of the meeting is very much around those 12 divisions and the 150 special interest groups. And so if we look at the SIGs, you can see, now you can search those ways too when you want to determine where you want to go. Now, are these SIGs and divisions a absolutely perfect reflection of the major areas of inquiry in the field? Well, of course not, because that's a dynamic and emerging process. So, uh, so there isn't a special education, which is a major field of inquiry and training and doctoral education within education research. There isn't a division, but there are many SIGs, uh, including one on special education that have large memberships and sessions. All of the allocations for the annual meeting, there is no special allocation for a division versus a SIG. We're all part of the same family and community and the session allocations in any year are based on the proportion of submissions to that unit by those who are interested in presenting uh, at the annual meeting. Uh, there are also committees that have open submissions of the AERA committees and those include not, not all, all of these committees have sessions, but not all of these have open submissions and I'll explain um, why in a minute. The Committee on Scholars and Advocates for Gender Equity in Education um, have an open submission and an allocation. The committee on, and those are the sessions uh, for that committee. Thanks, Robert, a lot. The Committee on Scholars of Color in Education also has an allocation. Uh, a sub open submission and an allocation. The International Relations Committee has uh, an open submission and allocation. I th and the, so those are the open submissions that you would see in the call. The Graduate Student Council has an allocation that has been granted to the Graduate Student Council so that they can do special programming, um, uh, particularly oriented to graduate student members, uh, almost one third of our membership that are our future and our graduate student council very, is very heavily engaged in planning those uh, sessions. And if I can just mention by not skipping over to the virtual meeting in our networking time, they will be uh, having networking sessions in the one hour networking time on um, days two, three, and four of the annual meeting. The Social Justice Action Committee also plans its sessions and it has an allocation of, I believe five, I'm not sure if they used all five this year. And that committee is an overarching committee. So they look at the program what has come in, what the nature of the program is, and they and their aim is to plan sessions that, uh, I won't say address topics that haven't been addressed, but kind of elevate uh, our the conversation that, uh, that may go on around um, a particular topic. So I think there may be four this year, not five, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Is that right, Robert, four? They have five. They have five, they've used the allocation. And in this uh, shopping mode, uh, if we can go back to the longer list, it is um, when you're deciding where to go, you can do a little bit of looking now. You've got your specialty areas of interest, but we always emphasize 
in an orientation like this, that it's worth kind of attending things that may be outside of your specific specialty, but have an interest to you. You will, uh, the president and the presidential program committee have worked very hard on this theme and going to presidential sessions, and there are some 30, four or five of them um, uh, around uh, the, the uh, theme of this year's meeting, accepting responsibility by we as researchers and the research community. We encourage that you attend some of those or look at those in the AERA research uh, and science policy series. Um, <clears throat> So there are many sessions that are AERA wide. There are the lectures, there are the invited speakers and look at the program uh, that is now accessible with all of those components. Maybe not every last session, but most sessions of the invitational sort <clears throat> are already there. And think about where you might wanna go. And one of the things I wanna emphasize is that some sessions have the word invited after them that doesn't mean you need to be invited. That means that in the small part of the 100% of the ARA annual meeting program that I said might be two or 3%, um, those were planned sessions. So that um, they may have been actually proposed by members to the presidential committee. It does not mean that the presidential committee and the president and co-chairs have invented them all but they are invitational sessions or award winners. Um, and that doesn't mean you need to be invited to those sessions. Everything in the meeting is an open session, um, whether it has been in the competitively selected uh, program or the invitational program. So often in this orientation, the question comes up, um, um, what, well, what does this mean, an invited session? Does that mean I needed to have an invitation? And, uh, and the answer is no. Uh, we don't have, gov we are doing our governance meetings, committee meetings that usually happen at the annual meeting. We are doing those at a different time in, uh, in May um, so, that, um, so that everyone can attend and value and experience uh, the virtual platform and what it offers. I think we have now actually done a bit of uh, topic three, which is touring the meeting and, 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 and uh, taking to heart uh, the opportunity of being in different places, both different places where you will be able to meet up uh, and talk with others. So all sessions that, that we anticipate to be under a hundred in attendance, which is uh, uh, the paper sessions, the round tables where you cluster around a table or the um, poster sessions, those will be opportunities where cameras can be on and mics will be live. And those are all more uh, interactive in a way, as are of the session submissions or the planned session, uh, invited session uh, um, sessions. Uh, um, the those uh, that are structured poster sessions and structured roundtables have that what we might conventionally think of as breakout modes, where you where there's opportunity to um, talk one-on-one, um, -on -one, uh, not literally one-on-one, -on -one, but group on one or two uh, with, um, with others. So for example, ARA has two volumes uh, that one closer to moving into production, which is a mega volume on um, faculty of color. And uh, those works are having their final moments of polish. I think there are about uh, 60 or so, is that right, Robert, chapters? And there are two, six, there are two round tables where essentially the, um, uh, the session um, are the authors of those chapters with an opportunity to join those authors around a discussion of those issues. 
The other handbook in process is the handbook on ed research policy. Uh, earlier along in its development, but yet with chapter authors, and that will also be um, a session in the roundtable mode uh, that is being held on the 8th. And that's a great way to interact and to meet people, in particular, uh, people who are there that might have shared interests. Um, and that is very much true of the roundtables and the poster sessions, because with a poster session that is scheduled essentially for an hour, it's the poster author or authors with whoever chooses to visit in that kind of small room setting. Uh, so let me describe very briefly these submissions that I hope at least by making reference to indirectly, I suppose, uh, and maybe other things that you've attended, you have a feel for those. As I started by saying that all accepted papers, and so if you've had an accepted paper, single or multi, multiple authored, congratulations. That, you know, um, we, we have, we're one of the smaller number, I won't say the only, that has a blind peer review for papers um, that have uh, panels well qualified to review those papers. And in the early versioning stage being successful, less than 50% of the time, congratulations. You know, that is, and that's why we emphasize that, that, that your paper, um, that is your paper in the early versioning stage or your presentation is an accomplishment in and of itself. In a paper session, those uh, um, this year, are um, an hour and a half, um, as they typically are in a place-based meeting. The, those are papers that have been submitted with an effort in a paper session as much as possible to cluster them around a similar set of issues or something that binds them together with a chair that isn't just a timekeeper, but a chair, not even primarily a timekeeper, although that's important, but a chair that has a touch and feel of that subject area as uh, has been uh, has been has been selected by the program a committee of that unit to chair. So has some degree of experience, whether early career or later career, and effectively um, facilitating discussion. And typically, each paper receives around ten minutes. Most typically, the Q and A comes at the end of three to five papers. But if it's only three or four, it may be that the chair will communicate with you in advance and say, well, we'll entertain a few questions intermittently. And, uh, and the chair you know, has at least a affirmative, if not obligation, both obligation and commitment to try to ensure the time allocation so that those at the end, uh, let's say the third or fourth paper is in short shrift, the time allocation. Um, almost, well, more than a decade ago, ARA, uh, based on a recommendation from really its membership and a committee made a recommendation to council to no longer even necessarily require or think that having a discussion for a paper session is the best opportunity, that maybe having those in the uh, audience, the attendees, ask their own questions and have the moderator have some questions and some crosstalk among the paper presenters might be the better mode. Discussions can work extremely well when they know their role, but there were lots of reports that discussions became doing their own paper and presenting their own view. So our discussions have very strongly the charge and the obligation when there is a discussion to really reflect on the papers, uh, raise some issues, maybe go beyond and press the paper authors to things that they might be either considering or now doing that might further um, enhance the work that they have underway. But there is always time for Q&A and the moderator, the chair of your session makes no difference that it's virtual. Uh, the persons attending can have their mics on. If there are too many attending, they can, the chair can say raise the hand function and call upon persons 
as I could do. I don't see um, Nathan Bell or Laurie Hill, my two colleagues, in terms of their uh, videos on, but I see their names and I could call upon them to say, and what are we seeing in the Q&A box? And so the chair will be doing that in a paper session. Uh, the platform, I suppose, I'd like to say, and we'll talk about the platform in a few minutes, um, will have all of the benefits of what you've seen <laughs> Uh, and experience, you will be able to share screen if you're presenting and you can then pick up your uh, interactive presentation. And I, of course we suggest just as in a live session, you might go up to the computer or um, and, and put on the desktop, let's say your PowerPoint. In uh, of course here, we're not all together in the virtual space. So you will not put it in a shared space you will share. So if you're on a paper session and you're a presenter and you want to be able to use some visualization or your bullets, whether they're in, if they're in the interactive presentation mode, you will go to the gallery and it will be just as if you had a web base tab open um, on the top of your screen. If you're doing a PowerPoint type presentation, that's sitting in my docs, you should do the same thing in advance of the talk as we all do do, put it on your desktop. So you're not going through 150 saved documents to remember where you put your presentation. When you are speaking, you will do share screen in the, whether you use iPresentation or whether you use something else, you'll be sharing that screen um, and the attendee, you as an attendee, when you are attending the meeting, can go full screen with that presentation. So for those with uh, um, those who want to see everything in with a broader visualization, whether it's pictorial or whether it's word, we of course encourage you to use um, in a way that really isn't so available when you're projecting on a screen at a place-based meeting. The experience though in the paper sessions will be much the same. The round table does not have uh, a discussion at all. The round table has a chair facilitator of a round table discussion. There are again, three to five papers clustered in a round table. Uh, they may have single authors or multiple authors. Um, uh, if, uh, but whatever the, and, and you are together and you will be essentially in, I suppose in the Zoom analog, you will essentially be meeting mode in a round table session that's place-based, uh, you're sitting around a table and you're sitting around a table with lots of other tables in the room. So we actually tried to divide up in place-based meeting, the number of tables in a room so that when you want to cluster around it, you're not distracted by voices at another table. In the platform, you will not be distracted because you will be in your own private room. You who will be discussing the, your papers, if, you're a paper, uh, if your paper is in a round table or if you attend, you will be part of that community. And uh, those are an hour. And we anticipate those probably won't be at any point in time more than, you know, 15, 20, 25 people. But because it's virtual, actually it could be many more in a place-based meeting with so many round tables, rarely are, uh, would you have clusters of people joining you, however much the interest in your, in your topical area of the round table, whether substantive, methodological or theoretical. And the, and the chair will essentially say, well, we're gonna you know, have a conversation together or, uh, about your papers. Um, uh, uh, kind of like, I'd say, like a uh, lightning talk, you're not giving a formal talk or what we call an ed talk or a TED talk. What you really want to do in that context and what you expect if you go to that session is that it's dominantly around the discussion that the um, roundtable participants are having together. But to have a discussion of any merit, you've got to put some something on the table and that might be 
three or four minutes kind of opening around what the work was about. It might be what's, you know, what you're struggling with. It might be an opportunity to do a, uh, let's say you've done an ethnography in two or three sites and you now have an opportunity to replicate it in a third site, but you're kind of wondering whether to alter the model given your findings were not as um, insightful as they might have been if you had done more in-depth single interviews than focus groups. So you can raise what it is. You wanna say something about what you did, um, what its essence was and, 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 and see that as the topic of conversation, but you can put on the table what you think would be helpful to have discussed with a group of colleagues who have similarly situated interests. In the typical mode of a round table, you're in a table in a ballroom. So, and it is not intended as a formal presentation. Do we know that that sometimes happens? Yeah, we know that, but then it really diminishes the experience for both those who were sharing the space to talk together. And frankly, it diminishes the experience for the attendee who thought they were having an opportunity to join a conversation. But, you know, um, I don't want to say life short, but things take a variety of forms and ARA doesn't dictate it other than I suppose if you were presenting, if you really want to present a paper, you should probably have opted for the paper submission mode because this is intended to be a, a more dynamic and interactive way of connecting with colleagues and having other colleagues uh, connect with you. Because we are in the virtual world and even when uh, when um, roundtables are really, you know, kind of full steam ahead, hitting the mark. What happens at a roundtable is people might have had a handout or they might want to show, you know, maybe they want to show a little clip of something um, or um, uh, uh, they might have something on their iPad or something. So anyone in a roundtable will have the same um, shared screen capacity as in a paper session or a poster session. And so I suppose we are encouraging that when that happens, that not be a surrogate for taking 10 or 15 minutes and dividing everything into, you know, 10 or 15 segments among three or five of you. But that's the moment when you want to share an epiphany kind of thing that will, you know, a visual or and describing that visual for those who can't see it or a few um, or a few points from a table will make the point that will take you longer to do in your initial opening or even later when you're trying to refer to a point than, um, uh, than, um, uh, than, it, uh, than it would without it. And, and you will have that same capacity. And if you attend that session, I suppose some presenting will want to pull up things that they otherwise might have passed around or maybe didn't even have the opportunity to do. The poster session is a, um, uh, essentially um, uh, in a play-based meeting with, uh, and many of you I'm sure have been to our, or well, if your first time is not ours, but other meetings that have poster boards where you, where you essentially pin your, board, your poster on that board that, hopefully provides an engaging and not too text intensive uh, um, presentation of the essence of your paper and uh, the essence of your findings, your methodology, your objectives, um, what you've learned um, and how you want to do that in essentially a poster display. Um, uh, the, uh, in the virtual meeting, instead of being in maybe a three to five foot space with a table and a poster board and people walk up, usually individually, sometimes a couple of people will walk up. Maybe it's the person that has the poster across the aisle. You two might engage in, or you three if, or four if there are multiple authors. You and your authors in a poster session um, uh, will essentially be in a room together uh, the posters are all an hour uh, in time, but you as a presenter will know both who's come to the room and, and how many. So if you're using the I presentation, 
uh, mode, you will see the um, all of the panels at once, whether you've, uh, um, whether you've, you'll bring it up in the same shared screen mode and maybe open one, Robert, from, uh, this is uh, 450 papers were done last fall by people who wanted to experiment by their 2020 papers, we had canceled the meeting. So that might look like a poster, um, um, you know, if it were on a poster board. It is a presentation that can be used for the papers and we're encouraging that use. You will bring that up in shared screen and somebody might, you might say, if someone comes in, do you want to scan? Um, I can't, you know, uh, here, are, here are my panels. Do you want to scan uh, them? And then we can talk about it and you can do your first scan. If there are three or four people, you might say, might you like me to do an overview presentation? Now this overview presentation has many, many more features, wh whether you're using it in a paper session, a roundtable session, a symposia presentation, or a poster session, it has many, many more features because it's a web-based product. So you can, um, you can play narration, you can show tables. Each of these panels um, opens up. You can open that up and scroll down. You can, uh, and, and, and so this session today is not about how you do that. We have four sessions on how you create um, a, an interactive presentation on mon uh, Monday uh, and the video is, I believe, already up. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues, uh, Lori Santa Maria, who um, uh, did two of her 2020 papers in the gallery uh, in October or November of this year. Uh, the 2020 meeting, as I emphasize, many of you know, was canceled, uh, but we did invite people to kind of experiment with this motif. And um, if you're doing uh, a poster, you'll want to get, if you're attending, you go into this room and if others are there, you might pick up upon that conversation or um, you'll be called upon, you know, to, you, you know, you might say, well, could you give me a little overview from the beginning? It really is as close to a small group. You may be the only person at the outset. Uh, someone may not, a poster session may open without anyone there. It may be that two or three people will walk in. And so how you will experience this as an attendee um, is essentially, um, a, it's a much more of a one-to-one -one communication or a three to four and one communication. You won't have to jump into a conversation as much as look at the panels and, um, and initiate uh, your own. And if I could then just say briefly about the session submission types, they kind of vary. Sometimes we use the um, Robert, you want to close that one screen? We use that, um, the language of, of uh, symposia. Um, but the sessions don't necessarily take the form of um, uh, three or four, four or five panelists. It could be a great debate. It could be a focal presentation and commentator discussions. Um, it, it could be a workshop, although there are fewer workshops um, uh, uh, that, are, uh, that are proposed each year, but it may be a, 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 um, a workshop. It could be a proposed session or an invited session for a structured roundtable, and they may be, as I described about our two handbooks, they, there might be some general discussion around an issue and then some um, table talk, and you can pick your own table if you're an attendee, or you can bounce over to another table if there are 10 or 12 of those tables, or there may be posters embedded around a theme that has been proposed. And, and those would be also separate, when it gets to seeing those posters, those would be separate poster presentation times after some general discussion, then the chair or the presenters might say, okay, well, let's have a look, uh, uh, um, a, um, a look at the posters that we have organized around 
um, challenges worldwide on um, school dropouts and uh, and then we'll reconvene and talk about what we've learned in the last 20 minutes and then that would happen in that way. Most typically it is um, some form of presentation but my own experience and perhaps your own experience in meetings is that um, that increasingly uh, the, there's much more of an attention to engaging with the community, even if it's not like a town hall meeting, so that the presentation modes um, are somewhat briefer, so that there's more opportunity for crosstalk among the panelists and engagement from the audience. And I think in symposia that tend to have um, 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 and the anticipation of uh, larger audiences because they tend to uh, be cross-cutting across more issues uh, that a briefer presentation sort of allows um, epistemically for um, more voices and, and this cross-talk. So typically, even though we encourage it with paper sessions and roundtable sessions, typically those um, participating in a symposia will, well, in the, in the play-space meeting, will have scheduled a phone call before. Now, in the sharing of papers, I want to underscore that for all papers um, in roundtables or in paper sessions or uh, um, uh, submitted and are part of symposia, those are accessible to, um, uh, to the chair and the discussant or the commentators. Um, I suppose my uh, informal advice is that those on a session will have a much richer opportunity if you share it with each other. Because if only the discussant or the commentators have a sense of what you've done, and if only uh, the chair um, has read this in any detail, you're essentially in a session that might have uh, three or four presentations and a chair and maybe two or one discussant. Of the eight, only four of you will be any more familiar with your work than what you're hearing on the spot. Um, I wanna underscore that whether you share your paper, whether someone's attending or not, I mean, attending a session or not with a shared paper, that's why we encourage sharing, uh, that we, um, whether it's a paper session, a round table, a poster session, that um, sharing your work, whether you literally share it, which we encourage, or just present it, is a, an act of collaboration across our, our research community. And when I say that, those who are attending for sure, and those who are um, who otherwise um, may learn about or hear hear about your work or read about your work, it is no more appropriate for someone to take a picture of a PowerPoint seated in an audience and expropriate it as their own than it is to do that with a paper that's shared. ARA has a very high standard of encouraging trustworthiness, collaboration, collegiality, and respectfulness in our community in every way. And we take seriously any form of fabrication, falsification, misappropriation of information, or, um, uh, or plagiarism in any of its forms. We like to think it doesn't happen um, as much as it might, and we certainly have taken seriously complaints about that. And, um, but the fact that you're sharing your paper where you will have a unique citation, whether it's in the paper repository in the interactive presentation gallery, the fact that you are opening up communities of collaboration and conversation well larger than you could anywhere anticipate I want to assure you does not make you any more vulnerable than just using verbal talk and having someone um, hear that um, and, and 
misuse that in any way that would be uh, strictly um, uh, investigated and uh, enforced by AERA. Saying that is not to make, um, is to make you feel uh, comfortable with doing that and not to say uh, these are problems we expect to arise. We expect that they do not arise and they can arise anywhere in a community. A peer reviewer of a manuscript can misappropriate that manuscript. If that happens by a peer reviewer of a paper submission to the AERA annual meeting, we, have, we would investigate that. If that happened with one of our journals and any other credible publisher of a journal, would take that equally seriously. So we just want you to know this is a safe space and, and sharing does not um, put you in an adverse position. It ideally um, advantages you in building the community of, of collaboration that we hope is what drew you um, to come to as a first timer, new member uh, to the annual meeting this year. And with that, I think we covered already the topic of, uh, in Robert's walking us through how to use the annual meeting um, uh, searchable program that's already online. Robert's gonna do a short so that we have opportunity for questions and there's many other videos around this and we're unfolding more user-friendly introductions to the virtual platform. But now let's, let's imagine together that we are uh, it's the uh, April 8th and we're coming to the virtual platform and I'm going to turn that over to Robert who's going to give us a sense of that experience. Robert? Good afternoon. Um, this is the landing page for our virtual platform. Um, on Friday morning, those of you who have registered for the meeting will receive a uh, login and password uh, and you'll enter it here and click on the login. Now, um, I will tell you where uh, this is gonna be a little bit of a hard hat tour. We're still uh, construction going on uh, as, we, as we do this, but we wanna show this to you. So we're gonna click on login. And when you land, first come into the platform, you'll see a number of uh, boxes here that will have content for you to look at and, and uh, messages for the day and other content. So um, you'll want to stop here. And then once you've gone through that, you want to go ahead and click to enter and you'll come into our convention center, uh, our virtual center. Um, as you can see from here, um, we have a couple of different tools. I'd like to first sort of point out um, where we are. We, this link was to today's events. And when you click on that, you'll see that there are a number of events that are happening. Uh, our, the team at, at uh, Scarrett, which is the company we're using, they're testing out the system. So uh, you'll see there are a couple of different things. When you want to go to a session, you can find it a couple of different ways. You can see everything that's listed today. You can sort by um, session name or author or, or event uh, date and time. Also be able to search by division and, and SIG or unit. Uh, other ways, if you know that you're going to a, a roundtable session, it'll pull up all of those. You also have the ability to search by keyword. And if you type in um, something in the title or something you have an interest in, it will, it'll pull it up from there as well. Um, as you walk through this and see this, the sessions that you'd like to go to, you can click on the, the heart and it will appear in your schedule. And so this is a way for you to build your schedule uh, for the, for the uh, conference and know which sessions you wanna go to. Um, upcoming events are things that are, are in that time slot that'll be posted. And on demand is if there's a session that you uh, missed, you can come into this area and take a look at it. Just by clicking on the link, we'll go ahead and click on this one and you'll see that um, the video would play. And there's a, uh, now this is an interesting window. It says, do you wanna continue? You left off at the five second mark. Um, the system will remember where you were if you were watching a, a video. So, or a recording of a uh, previously hosted session. The, um, the platform will be open for a year. So you'll have the opportunity to come in and go out 
uh, over that time and revisit uh, videos or, or sessions that you started to watch and maybe had to, to, to stop. Uh, so this is just a, 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 a broadcast that they have in from another conference as we our content hasn't started. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and we'll continue. Um, there are a couple of ways to navigate. You, this isn't really where you are, you're just in the lobby. If we come down to this lower bar, you'll see that again, you can, um, and, and this, this bar here on the bottom stays with you throughout the platform. Um, you, sessions that you said that you wanted to attend, your, your favorites, you can do a search. You, we have a map and let me stop there for a minute. And these are all the different places that you could go within our platform uh, for different things, whether it's the virtual session rooms or our help desk or the on-demand library where those, those archive sessions will appear. Um, the presentation gallery, that's uh, where the um, I presentations, you can access them from, from there. We're gonna go ahead and click on that for a second. You'll come in, you can see that we have a a, a little bit of still getting the signs and, and whatnot up. It's sort of like being at the convention center a day or two before the meeting starts. And you would click on this link and that would take you to the iPresentation platform. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go back to our map and we'll see that we have the exhibit hall and we can click on that. And when you arrive here, you will click on this exhibitor directory and you'll see that they have, I guess they're reloading. We've, we've got quite a few exhibitors. They're just sort of repurposing them at the moment. So uh, you could come in and take a look, uh, you know, click on this particular booth and you could visit the booth. And um, there will be links and videos and uh, ways for you to reach out and speak to the exhibitor. Uh, there'll be a link up above with a camera. And if you click on that, that'll give you a face-to-face -face meeting with the exhibitor. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo that uh, system for you right now. I'm going to go ahead and go back to, uh, you could be anywhere, but uh, I'm going to go back to the lobby. Um, and uh, if you want to reach out to someone in the system, you can click on this uh, bar right here that says chat. And you see there are any number of people who are there. And to see exactly who's here, we can click on this who's here button. And I can see that uh, quite a few of our developers are here. And it looks like uh, some of the meetings team is, is with us at the moment. So I'm gonna reach out to, uh, to Kendra and say, uh, Kendra, uh, are you available for a chat? And um, in a, if she is, she'll respond and we can see that she is. And so we say yes. Uh, so um, if I want to uh, see who else is here, I can, let's say we'll click on uh, another one of our meetings team. You can see that uh, here is her profile, a picture and her title, and I'll show you how to modify that in just a second. And we will um, kind of close this and open this. And let's say we knew that we were going to chat at uh, four o'clock. I can click on this link, which is a little camera, and I'm now calling her and she's responded. And I'll say uh, allow. And you can see my picture. And there you see Mary. Hi, Mary. So, so just, hey. like, just like that, uh, you can set up a private conversation. You can set up a group, uh, a user group, and then invite uh, individuals to join you. So you can still have that uh, feeling of running into somebody in the hallway. Uh, so it will work that same way in the exhibitor booth. Thank you, Mary. And so. uh, I think one of the things to emphasize about the exhibitor booth, uh, unlike many meetings is actually, the exhibitors will be there during open hours. There will be, uh, just as we're staffing the help desk uh, um, 
there will be persons you can meet with about, uh, about books you want to adopt for courses, uh, manuscripts you might uh, have in mind, uh, uh, an interest in being a, a journal editor, uh, a reviewer, or, or a manuscript you want to submit. Um, um, there are funding agencies and uh, research institutions that have booths. You will be literally meeting with live persons <laughs> on in real time, and you can use that chat function uh, to do so. And, but if there are several persons in the room, the exhibitor also has a camera where everybody can have a conversation together or one member of the exhibitor staff might have a private meeting and those and 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 move into the private mode whether uh, whether on the phone function or the video function so there's a lot of latitude in not only is there a lot of latitude when you want to do your own social networking with um, a person you've just met, uh, uh, um, someone you went to school with, uh, a mentor, uh, prior students, or whatever that might be, uh, you will have you have that individuals have that networking function uh, on their own to do really any place, any time. It's like saying let's have a cup of coffee together, uh, or you can schedule a group and you can do it in advance. <laughs> And of course, we want you all to go to sessions, but you know, you can do just what people do, you know, just like um, going out for lunch or going to a museum. If you want to hang out with some persons and you're skipping a session, I don't want to exactly say more power to you because of course we want our sessions to be attended, but really, you know, that's part of the meeting is, is that informality, that networking, you might just have seen a wonderful uh, session or gone to a round table and you're interested the next day in following up and, and you'll be able to do so. Um, Robert, could you go to the, um, uh, what is the um, informal networking space? Doesn't that look nice? So <laughs> in the informal networking space, there will be each day approximately, let's say 15, uh, uh, during the, the informal networking space, during the, um, is it 120 to 220 Eastern time? Right? That is correct. 120 to 220 Eastern time, we'll have uh, designed opportunities that I might have mentioned when I mentioned that the Graduate Student Council will be hosting um, one such room uh, um, on the um, um, on Friday, the second day, the third day, Saturday and Sunday of the um, of the meeting. I actually have to remind myself what we're doing the fourth day. But um, during that time, um, it'll be like seeing a, a bunch of tiles like on the exhibitors. You will see a topic um, or you might see a host or maybe a prior president would was going to host a table on um, you know kind of an open conversation on um, on research uh, uh, opportunities in the field or a funder might be doing that um, and so there'll be topical tables that you can join and that's an opportunity for networking with each other we're kind of anticipating maybe 15 or 20 people at the outside at a table. So it'll be kind of like being in a small room together, all the mics will be on. It's a good time to take a break. No formal presentations uh, might be on um, navigating the job market during COVID. We're working out both subjects and chairs. Um, and some may just be uh, persons who've, you know, uh, navigated a, a career lines in particular specialties um, those working in um, environments outside of colleges and universities, research institutes, uh, working in uh, agencies that, uh, that home the state longitudinal administrative data systems in the United States, uh, persons working in international settings, and an opportunity across those topics. During that one hour, it's a hangout. I saw that as a question. Um, as Robert was presenting um, that said, we will get to answer that question. So I hope that gives you a feel of how you can do your networking on your own 
um, in the session schedule, there's a morning in, in East Coast time, um, but recognizing that's afternoon or quite late at night in other times to do informal hanging out. So we start, as Robert is now showing you, on Friday uh, with uh, day two with a networking break. The first day starts middle of the day. And, and then the hour break is when you can network on your own. You could leave your, <laughs> you can leave your screen on and, and, and do something else. Of course, you could do something else any time of the day, just like going and resting in your room at a place-based meeting. But during that one hour is when we're gonna offer of design networking opportunities. Uh, then there's a half hour break before what's stated here as business meeting, but it's really business meeting, uh, 152 two SIGs. You don't have to be a member of a SIG or division to go to a business meeting followed by a reception. Business meetings are typically quite brief. Some are longer and might not have breakout, may not have social gatherings, but the vast majority of the divisions and SIGs are also having pull down tables um, for various networking, sometimes around topics, sometimes around chairs. There are a few divisions to that have introduced games. Each one is kind of characteristic. I, I'd say the culture of that community, recognizing that, you know, that it's hard to totally translate what you do on the spot. You know, there's no dance and band, although I suppose that would be a good idea too. Um, and they, the, the breakout modes of those. So if you haven't gone to a meeting, don't feel you have to be a med member of the SIG or the business meeting. They're all listed in the program, how you find them, particularly if you want to go to one that you've never gone to before and you're not a member of any, you're a first timer, go to the schedule, put in 615 to 815, nothing else is going on in that block, scan them. You, you, you'll see the name of the SIG or the division and, and then put it in your schedule and have a good time. And, and that's, the, that's, that's the way we hope this environment um, not only is attentive to the, uh, the, the experience and sharing of research and important content at the various stages of the research enterprise, but also as one one gathers together at a meeting provides for these informal opportunities. We had a question in the uh, chat box um, and I just wanted to address it. When you go to a round table session or a structured poster session or a poster session, when you, you'll see the title of that session here and you will go to it and you will have a, a menu right here. And when you click on that, that'll be, that will show the different posters and roundtables that are in that session. So that's how you would uh, access an individual um, structured poster after the brief presentation at the, at the start or a poster session. So I just wanted to highlight that for someone who asked that question. Uh, that's right, for a structured poster session or a structured roundtable where there's some general crosstalk, and that's actually the way the business meetings operate too, where there's some general crosstalk that might just be a few minutes and then breaking out into those um, structured roundtables or structured posters. So it's embedded within a general session. And essentially, uh, like we showed you with the exhibits, um, uh, a screen will pop out, will, will, will come down or you'll draw it down. It'll open these options, whether it's 12, 15 or 25, and then you pick the one you want to go to. If you want to go to another one, you'll be able to do so. I know we're short on time. I want to show just two quick other features. We have uh, forums, and this is sort of like um, a blog. During the meeting, you can set up your own question or uh, category and um, have folks throughout the meeting respond to you. So it's uh, on any number of topics. And then finally, uh, uh, your profile. This is where you could come in and edit your profile. You can see I, I have not done that yet. Um, and when we click on that, there's an opportunity. If you'd like to upload a photo, you're welcome to, but you have to give your permission to, for it to be used. And also uh, for your contact information to be shared, you, you would have to give, you have to opt in. So just two quick things there. You have an opportunity if you'd like to um, 
insert a, a bio for folks to see. You can do that as well. And um, then there's one central place in the, in the platform and it's your office. And that gives you a place where you can go and see the, you know, your schedule, the, the uh, favorites you've selected, modify your profile and um, transcripts will uh, really be about um, a letter of participation or attendance for the meeting. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, next week um, as we roll that out. So those, I wanna leave time for Q and A. So with that, I will uh, turn it back to Felice. All right, so the one thing I wanna say is that uh, you can also, you can hit my schedule from those tabs. You don't have to go into your office. If you wanna go into your office and have a break, my schedule is right there. So you can see the today's events is actually gonna say um, ARA schedule. And my schedule is the, your particularistic schedule if you save it into my schedule, but you don't have to go to the office to see. <laughs> Anytime, every page has the option of seeing the schedule. So you don't, you don't right. have to go to the office, but it's, uh, you know, we gave you a nice little uh, uh, a college campus. This is our campus for the uh, or university campus. So this is our, um, or uh, this is our campus for the meeting. And uh, once you're familiar with the platform, you don't have to go, always go back to the map. We have this teleport button right here, and that will take you to right. so you don't all the to locations. To Those are all the choices. So it's kind of one stop shopping. We sort of want, once you sign in, once you sign in, the message is it's, it's really easy to get around. I want to emphasize if you want to be able to contact others, and have others contact you, you won't make your contact private because you won't be able to do that informal networking. I mean, you can go to an informal network, a planned session that we have, but you won't be able to, um, uh, it essentially, you're, you're secluding your informal networking ca capacity. If you hit private, then it's private. Your attendance at the annual meeting is not private. We have a registration list. We could have, you know, in the back of the old, well, it's not old for some of you, but ARA uh, decided to depart from having a print-based program after decades um, in 2019. But all participants and presenters are listed in an index. And, and essentially, that's not uh, private that you've attended the annual meeting, but you don't have to engage in any social interactions if you, if you hit the private space. With that, let, let's open it up for questions where we want to be here for you and there's many of you still here um uh so laurie and nathan what are you seeing or reading so felice can you talk briefly about whether there'll be an opportunity for individuals to practice live in the platform before the meeting uh if practice means how you get on and how you navigate uh uh the, if, if you mean that, and I suppose how you as a presenter, um, we've had some demonstrations of that that are in recordings. Uh, Scarrett is going, uh, Scarrett is the, is our platform inventor. Uh, and I think there are, I know, I don't remember how many there are, but two or three days next week, there are multiple sessions, multiple hours uh, that are trying to be calibrated so that it's a good experience uh, for you and there are not too many people in the room at once. And I think we're announcing those Friday, Robert? Is that yes, right? we are. Yeah. And um, you will be invited and no later than Monday, you'll be able to go in and set up your contact. You'll be able to look at what's already in the gallery. Um, if you are doing an interactive presentation, we actually have encouraged you doing it by Monday, but let me assure you, it's like doing your PowerPoint at the last minute. If you wanna do it three hours before and post it, you'll be able to bring it up as, if you're last minute, you can be last minute, you know. Um, um, the virtue of putting it up earlier, um, like, uh, and be able to share it with your, with others on your panel, but the virtue of putting it up is once it's up, you actually can change it or alter it and it, you know, I'm gonna say it virtually instantly republishes it. So if you see it in the gallery um, and you've put it up in, and you've posted it, so it's, it's available for you to look at, 
and you see it and you kind of say, oh, when people walk around, they might not understand this. You can just go back in and fix it and, and re-release it. Um, so uh, there's advantages to kind of beginning to see how the user might see it. It's like anything else, you know, you finish a paper, you think it's perfect, and then you send it off to someone and you find 10 typos on the first page because when you reread it, when you've created it, you sort of miss it. But once you see the visualization, you, but whatever you want, even though we encourage that, we don't want that to discourage doing an interactive presentation because of all of the other uh, advantages. Nathan? So Felice, what would you recommend for a graduate student who wants to get advice on their dissertation, for example, not some research they're presenting, but how would you, how would you recommend that they find people who might be able to give them advice or feedback or, or you know, research directions? What would your, what would your recommendations be? Um, I think that's a great topic for some tables. <laughs> uh, uh, one, place, one stopping place to stop, I would say, would actually be to the Graduate Student Council because um, you will then be experiencing uh, uh, colleagues who are at that dissertation stage. Depending upon, and I'm going to say, um, if you'd send me um, an email, which is flavine at A-E-R-A net, and give me a few more voice bites about the kind of advice you are seeking. So for example, it's not unlikely that one of our tables will be with one of our colleagues that does, um, that does um, uh, the how to get published. And part of the presentation in our how to get published mini course is how you take your dissertation um, and think about its repositioning for publication, how you identify a journal. So that's a particular question that you might have had or might be raised by you at the dissertation stage. So I would say, tell me what kind of advice you're looking for and we'll try to, I'll try to respond as to where you might go um, and, and, who, uh, and who you might contact or whether that's a good topic um, uh, for a table. If you've, um, um, if you've been in a session and you're working on a dissertation and you've kind of hit a stumbling block and, and maybe your own faculty hasn't been able to help you through that sufficiently, I'm gonna say there's two other ways we could tackle that. If you've heard uh, presentations or been in a round table where people have that set of questions, you really shouldn't be inhibited. It's actually kind of flattering for people to be contacted. I know I always like it myself. And, um, and so you can use, you might use the chat function and send um, a chat to that presenter or presenters and say, I'm kind of struggling with this issue or I have questions about this on my dissertation. You're really working in an aligned area. Would it be convenient to get together during the meeting where we could schedule a meetup time? Or if your schedule's booked, is there a time that we might be able to connect after the meeting? Those are kind of some of the opportunities, I think. Um, um, but if that wasn't a sufficient array of how you could do that, including after the meeting, um, um, you know, we have a, a very a strong professional development program that we offer proactively at our um, uh, all year round um, uh, through ARA. That's one of the things usually in the orientation we emphasize. We have four courses, mini courses that are four hours that are being offered on um, uh, the 13th through the 16th. I'm not saying that would meet your dissertation needs. Um, but, um, but we do have any number of workshops and courses already in our virtual research learning center. I don't remember, frankly, whether we have one on, well, you know, I'm struggling with how to take, how to move from my, a problem that interests me into oper operationalizing and conceptualizing a dissertation and the literature seems kind of vague in that area. What do I do next? 
you know, of course, we assume that in many locations, your advisor is your first point of reference and others who might be on your committee. But, you know, we know life isn't perfect. And if that doesn't seem like your best point of reference at this point in how you're feeling about it or the virtual world has provided less opportunity for communication, one of the things that we actually learned in our focus groups from early career scholars and doctoral students then use ARA as a resource. And, and, and we have a professional development email address and we have a fabulous director of professional development, George Wimberley. So Felice, I've been saving this question from the beginning. Someone asked, as a first time attendee, how best can I take advantage of all of the opportunities and networking that's going on at the meeting? Mm. Um, well, I would say, uh, first I'd say also come to the orientation if, it's, if the time zone works for you on the morning of day two. Then I would say in that one hour ban, um, uh, pick some of these informal opportunities because, because even though I just illustrated, don't hesitate to contact someone cold um, if you have a, you know, as you might not hesitate, you know, after a session, people kind of crowd up around each other. That's not gonna happen in a virtual meeting. So I would say uh, uh, two things, <laughs> three things here. Pick one, pick, a, pick some of the informal networking opportunities because that's gonna spawn an opportunity to meet up with some others who you are gonna have informal conversations with in that context. Then I would say early on, if, if something that's squarely in your interest isn't a, is a business meeting or an informal networking opportunity, uh, and that's day three or four, and let's say it's a division, uh, but, that, but their, their uh, event is not until the third day, pick a SIG um, that's aligned with your specialty areas or proximal to them. And those are smaller collaborative units by and large and go to one of their events and you can be able to, you, then you will sit pick a breakout table and hang out and you're gonna meet people at a personal level and not hold off until day three. I'd say the reverse too, if you're, if there's a, one of the 12 divisions approximately aligns with what you do research in, go to that first, even though you'll wanna sample uh, some of the uh, SIG events and go to the, go to the round tables. <laughs> the round tables are, if they running, if they're running well, go to a round table in the, your area of interest. You'll be able to sort by all of those areas of interest that are listed when people submit papers. I think it maxes out at three. You can sort by area of interest. You can sort by SIG and type of session. Let's say you did it that way or division. And let's say you did a, a three-way sort. You'll identify something that's topically of interest in a unit of interest. Uh, in a paper session, a round table, and I'm gonna say hit those poster sessions because those poster sessions with someone who's had an accepted paper and wants to present more visually and orally and engage in one-to-one, -one, it's a perfect opportunity to meet people one-to-one. -one. That's, that's what we would say in the orientation and I appreciate the question and I, I hope it helps because we really want you to feel part of the community and I will say no matter how successful and how many times people go to an annual meeting, there's that person saying inside, well, who do I really know here except for the people I've hung out with forever? How am I gonna make, you know, how am I gonna make this day when I come away from the annual meeting offer new connections that I haven't had before, both for, for socio-emotional professional reasons, uh, you know, health and well-being reasons, um, ways of having people read your work, not just the instrumental kind of thing of, you know, or not even especially the instrumental kind of thing of, you know, networking in the crassest sense. But in the best sense of the word, that's what we're, that's what we like to think ARA is all about. When we miss that goal, frankly, we try to reinvent ourselves and the virtual space 
is an opportunity for that reinvention. And we hope it offers something that um, um, through the single sign-on environment, this, this community, we hope that community, that all of you capitalize on this community advantage. I would say if you are not feeling after a couple of days that it's had that for you, there's going to be plenty of places you could go for advice, um, uh, including a, um, a dedicated email um, and even a dedicated phone number where you'll be able to reach me in particular if anything that seems off center or unwelcoming or just uncomfortable should happen. Um, we have that support. Um, we also have a ombuds program if you want to have some touch base and externally uh, independently work through some things with others. We really wanna be here for the community. We want you to come back and we really want you to love it, frankly. So we have no other open questions at this time. All right, uh, Laura, you saying anything? Anybody wanna raise their hand? I think that, that uh, Badu uh, could, uh, uh, who's uh, delivering the technology of our meeting, Acharya, uh, our savvy systems administrator in all things technological, we can, we can take some uh, raised hand questions or comments or anything else. We hope this has worked. If it hasn't, you can comment in a Q&A about that and, and we'll aim to do better. Anything, Bajut, that you're saying? Yes, we have Joseph Barry. Joseph, uh, you can talk now. Okay, Joseph. Oh, you have to unmute your mic. Or do we need to do it? Joseph, please unmute and talk. We having some technical problem? Nope, I allowed him to talk. I'm asking to unmute. Joseph, do you wanna text your question or um, are you hearing us well enough so that you can unmute yourself? Joseph, if you, see, if you see a prompt on your screen to unmute, please unmute and talk. Ah, perfect. Can you hear me now? Absolutely, welcome. Oh, thank you. I, I was, uh, I started to look for the chat to type, type in the question. I, I was, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't having luck pushing the button. It just kept on saying, like, All as right, if I wasn't, we... anyway. Welcome. Um, where where are you? Where what time zone are you in? Uh, I'm in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Okay. I'm from Central California, so it takes a minute for me to uh, take that in when you say that. So so it's uh the okay. Eastern, you know, Eastern time zone. Um, anyway, um, I just wanted to you know uh, bring up um, what uh, I asked the questions already in in the um, in the you know in the in the question format, mm -hmm. but I just bring up um, last year I was to go to the San Francisco um, um, you know AERA annual yeah. meeting mm -hmm. of course uh, as we know the the COVID thing kind of uh, you know through a yeah. monkey wrench mm -hmm. right and so <clears throat> I just wanted to say um, last year was a bit intimidating considering all the uh, technological kind of changes uh, when they offered to do the the virtual um, um, because I was going to do a roundtable session, and so they, uh, I got an offer to do the virtual presentation, if you will. Yeah. And I and side away from it, so I just, you know, I just wanted to throw it out there. I don't, I don't know how um, well the response has been as far as um, people participating in, in the stuff, but I think um, this year may be better than last year. If, if last year was a challenge at all, at least for me, I feel more comfortable, if you will, 
uh, navigating those kinds of things or attempting to navigate those things. And so, you know, I just wanted to, you know, chime in on that note, really. Well, thank you. You know, last year, um, uh, when the pandemic hit, well, it began taking off, I suppose, in February when it became obvious that first a place based meeting and then we thought a virtual meeting would not be possible and should not be pursued. We already got well out ahead of that way before, uh, way before it was defined as a global health crisis. We uh, decided there would be no place based meeting that would not be safe and secure for persons traveling or for those we would be who we would be meeting and seeing or those working in San Francisco should not have the influx of our 15 or 17,000 attendees. At that point, before that, we thought we could do this virtually, but as the pandemic was exploding, we realized that there were so many different ways in which persons were being affected um, and needing to change how they live their lives, having health and economic challenges. And then we decided by the end of March to not do that place-based meeting. So we hardly began scratching the surface of how you would for a round table or a poster do that interactive presentation as an alternative to um, you know, a PowerPoint or a Prezi or something else and be part of that gallery. I would say, Joseph, if you have an interest in taking the paper you were going to present in 2020 uh, and constructing it and adding it to the 2020 gallery, we'd be happy to support you in doing that with that prior paper. Since that time, of course, so when, what we did was we opened the gallery really in September and we did two trainings in September there's a lot of support. It is pretty intuitive and easy as if you saw, or if you take time to see the demonstration that one of our colleagues did on Monday, it's really, uh, uh, it, it can be done in quite a simple fashion. It becomes part of the gallery. It lives there all year round. So people can see your work can chat with you and reach you a great way of networking. But we just did it a kind of a soft opening for those who wanted to do it with their 2020 papers. And we had about 450 persons who decided to do so. You know, it's a paper that was nine months old. We already had given everyone a unique citation to the fact that they had an accepted paper. If they were in the paper repository, they also will, will, will have a DOI. So it was a third option that 450 people chose to do. Right now we have uh, quite, we have, I don't know how many the, how many will produce, but we have many thousands that um, of the 6,000 um, papers in paper sessions, poster sessions, round tables, or, um, or in symposia that are, um, that are in the creation mode. Uh, uh, I would suggest if you haven't started yet, um, you go in and start, <laughs> you've been invited. Um, there's, uh, if you've seen none of the training, I would say, um, I would say, uh, look at the one that we did on Monday, um, that a member who's experienced it did it. Um, um, we have a dedicated email box. If you run in Joseph or anybody else, if you run into a snag, uh, we have presentation-gallery at aera.net. And the uh, inventor, the small team of very uh, inventive um, um, entrepreneurs who developed this uh, uh, interactive web-based product actually also provide support. So don't be stymied. Actually, if you find you're stymied, um, uh, contact us because... Uh, uh, you know, kind of help is on the way. Anyone else? Any other hands up to do? Yes, we have Dr. Sophia Udard. Dr. Udard, please go ahead and talk. Welcome. You need to unmute if you see the prompt on your screen. 
And thanks, Joseph. Dr. Uder, you are allowed to talk. Please unmute and speak. Must be some unmuting glitch. This Joseph seems to have a problem unmuting. Dr. Udard, you are allowed to talk. Please unmute. Dude, is there any other instruction? Because Joseph had problems too. No, that's the only instruction. I am prompting her to unmute. She should be seeing and prompt, a prompt on her screen. Dr. Woodard, is there, can you say in the Q&A what your problem seems to be? And we'll try to see if we can correct it. The alternate option is I can promote her as a speaker to speak and be seen on the screen if she wants. Okay, whatever you need to do. The microphone icon is at the bottom of the yeah. screen on the left. Ah, good. Well, it went off and on. Bottom of the screen on the left. So Dr. Sophia Udard, you are a panelist, a speaker now. You need to unmute and speak. Can you unmute a panelist, uh, Dude, I think you can, can't no, you? No, I cannot. I can mute. I'm sending her a prompt to unmute. You see me tipping my head, I was trying to see the a chat pop up. Okay. Oh, All right. Looks somebody like raised a, hand, then lowered hand. Is there another hand? There oh. was another hand, then she lowered her hand. Okay. Anybody, anybody else who wants to try whether they can unmute? Uh, I do not see anybody has raised hand. Okay. All right, well, Dr. Woodard, we're sorry that we couldn't get through. If you put your question or a comment in, I suppose at this point, either chat or Q&A, we'll, we'll get back to you. I want to thank everyone for joining. I want to thank Robert for joining with me and displaying all that the platform has to offer and really all that the program has to offer. There'll be, uh, we're trying to hone the information so that there isn't uh, information overload, but that it serves you well. If you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask and really thanks everybody for joining. Um, we wish we could be together and in person. Uh, the, there will be that uh, additional orientation on the morning of the um, ninth uh, Eastern time morning uh, in the United States. And um, we hope that this has been helpful and we've enjoyed the opportunity of being with you. Thank you all.